only uh, impacting there, but I think six different nations come together, churches come, so it's kind of a mini conference, uh, teach on healing. Uh, I had a, a great time. I start very early in the morning meeting with the pastors, answering questions. We had uh, morning seminars. During the break, I answered more questions. At breakfast, there was more questions. At lunch, you're sensing a pattern here. At lunch, there was more questions. And so that was great. But just want to show you some videos. We held it this year. They used to hold it in a tent, but they, where they had it was under construction, hoping they got the sound up here. But this is a beautiful theater in uh, downtown Almeria. We had, uh, I think, on this service, there were some 500 people in this beautiful old theater. Lots and lots of visitors there. So in it, uh, I'm waiting on the, the numbers. They would have had um, probably 150 people saved, I would say, over the, the four services. Then I want to show you, I, in <clears throat> all the years I've been praying for the sick, I've prayed for many people with strokes, so hold on, wait, wait, don't, don't, don't play them until I tell you to, there you go. So uh, I've prayed for many people with strokes. Honestly, I've never seen but just the tiniest improvement. I wanna show you this. This next video, they had a man that was very severe. They had to carry him on stage. He had one of the brace crutches and uh, they had to carry him. He could not speak at all. <clears throat> he could barely, barely walk, could not lift his arms. Uh, they actually didn't even bring him up to pray. The guys who were, who were screening, they didn't have much confidence that he was going to get healed. Uh, I wish I could say a God's man of faith and power felt it. I didn't have a lot of confidence. So we'll see here is actually when I'm praying for him, which is just very quickly here on stage. And this is right at the end of the service. So we just quickly prayed for him. And then we uh, ended the service. I turned it to the pastor. So as the service ended, I then someone asked me to come pray for them. While I'm praying for these people, I can hear people shouting. And they start cheering. And when I turn around, this man with a stroke is walking. You're going to see it at the point he's walked all across the front. And one of the brothers from England, these were very steep stairs with no handrail. One of the guys from England tells him, go up the stairs. And I was thinking, oh, Jesus. <laughs> Let's watch the next video. And here he is before they had to carry him up these stairs. And now... He walks up by himself in this. <laughs> yeah. And then watch, watch him. Alberto tells him, can you raise your arms? Raise your arms. Look at this. He starts raising his arms like this. And now he's walking across the stage here. Absolutely could not do that before. And you see, he keeps putting his hand on his head like, oh my God. <laughs> Very powerful. Moving his arms, walking. Thank God. Isn't that wonderful? And that is a, a miracle I have actually never seen myself before. So that was very powerful. Uh, he came the next night. I prayed for him the next night. He came walk. He walked all the way home without his cane. Came back the next night. He could not speak at all. We prayed for him again, and then he was able to repeat and say Jesus when we did the second night. And then they uh, they had a follow up revival. He's been coming every night, walking to the crusade. Isn't that wonderful? Let's give God praise for that. Thank God. Then. Uh, I was supposed to go my route home. I should have left Monday morning on my way to through England, but the queen died and she did not consult me to see whether it was convenient. And so they had to cancel flights. And so I had Tim Miller. He was uh, there to learn about crusades. And so I told Alberto, I can't be here. I have to go through 
Germany. I have to leave early. But I said, Tim Miller is my spiritual son. He's got my spirit. Uh, you can, your choice, but if you have him do it, he'll do it just like me. And here's the last night of the crusade. There is Tim Miller, our very own. He did a tremendous job, got great miracles, and a bunch of people saved on the final night. Thank God. Isn't that wonderful to see? We're thanking God. Praise God. Amen. If you brought your Bibles, turn with me to uh, the book of John chapter 2. John chapter 2, a, a team from the University of Oregon has built a system that can read people's thoughts via brain scans and they have people imagine someone's face and they have a scanner on the computer screen, they can reproduce what the, the face that the person was thinking of. Neuroscientist Bryce Cool says we can take they can record the activity of the brain and the visual cortex and they have people look at letters of the alphabet and they can reproduce it on the screen from their brain while they're doing it. So reading what is inside. The text that we're going to read, it says some people believed on Jesus, but it says he didn't commit himself to them because he knew what was in them. Or in other words, Jesus could see inside of them. He knew what was in them. So, this shows us God knows everything about us. That is both a challenge for some of us and that is encouragement for everyone. I want to preach a message I've entitled Being Known from John chapter 2. We're going to start reading at verse 23. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men, had no need that anyone should testify of men, for he knew what was in man. Being known. Let's talk first of all about inadequate attraction. In our text, there are people that are drawn to Jesus. There can be something in Jesus Christ that makes him attractive to us, that we would want to be near him. Matthew 14, 35, the men of that place, when they recognized him, they went, they sent out into all the surrounding region, and they brought to him all who were sick. There's a scripture, a real life testimony people are drawn to Jesus because he could heal them we have people that are drawn to Jesus intellectually they like the idea of Jesus the embodiment of love Jesus the good teacher others are drawn to Jesus emotionally they're hurting inside they're lonely and so their hope is if I come to Jesus he's going to take away all these feelings inside others are drawn to Jesus because of their problems I'm facing jail I don't want to go to prison I'm addicted my marriage is on the rocks and in the text that we just uh, uh, read uh, this is partly the miracles and this is uh, not a bad thing. Verse 23, when they saw the signs which he did. In a crusade that we just did or any healing crusade, you can have people, they will come for physical healing that normally you would never get them into church. So whatever the attraction is, all of those are good. Anything that brings you into contact with Jesus, that's good. But our text tells us what caused them to believe. Verse 23, many believed in his name when they saw 
the signs which he did. The book of John, you know this is actually at the end of the book of John. John says, the reason why I wrote this, what we know as the book of John, the reason why I wrote it to you is so that you would believe on his name. So we read that, it worked. It is exactly what we want. People came because they were sick or because they saw the miracles. They believed in Jesus and we think, fantastic. They got saved. They're going to stay saved forever. But Jesus was not so excited. Verse 24, Jesus did not commit himself to them. Or as one man said, they believed in Jesus, but Jesus didn't believe in them. That's another way of looking at that. Some belief in Jesus is not saving belief. James 2.19 says you believe that there's one God. You do well, demons believe, and they tremble. So I don't think that demons are getting saved, but they believe. And our text says some people believe that should be good, but the Bible says it's possible to believe intellectually and yet your heart not line up with uh, that belief. Matthew 15, 8, these people draw near to me with their mouth, honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. This word heart here, it's the center of your being. It is what you love and value the most. In this instance, it's actually talking about your will. What, why you choose, what you, you determine is right and wrong and best for your life. And Proverbs 4.23 says, guard your heart with all diligence for it determines the course of your life. You choose in life. You make decisions based on your heart, your will, that part of you that has the ability to choose. So if you are coming to Jesus on the basis of need, that may be good enough to get you into contact. It is not good enough over time. John 6, 26, you seek me not because of the sign, but because of the bread. In other words, Jesus says, come on, you only believed in me because I made you lunch. Free lunch. Oh, he's the Messiah, let's serve him forever. What's on the menu tomorrow? Jesus said, that's, that's not, free lunch is not good enough. Verse 24, Jesus didn't commit himself to them. That word commit is to trust or rely on, to lean on or literally build on. So Jesus is actually, he's not trusting their motives. Jesus, we believe in you. But he says, but I don't trust your motives. The question is why? Why do you believe? In context, Jesus had just cleansed the temple. There were people who believed that the religious system was corrupt. Maybe they said, good, that needed to happen. I'll believe in you. But in actual fact, some people are saying, I believe in you, so you will give me what I want. You have athletes. They will name the name of Jesus. After a touchdown, they will bow for a moment and have a little moment of prayer because in their minds, Jesus helps me win. I don't know if you remember that in the 80s. They had a whole bunch of testimony videos and and we used to mock them as the Jesus vitamin, is that they were athletes. I serve Jesus. Since I serve Jesus, I can run faster. I can jump higher. I can ski better. Jesus is like a vitamin. It's awesome. They're business people. I believe in Jesus because he's going to give me money. There are people, it's romance. I'm going to serve Jesus. He's going to give me a husband or a wife or a better husband, or a better wife. <laughs> but then what happens over time is things don't work out exactly like they thought. 
these people, I believe, so you'll give me what I want, but what happens if Jesus doesn't give you what you want? You know what happens. Many people at that point, they stop believing. Have you ever witnessed and had people say, yeah, yeah, I prayed one time. It just didn't work for me. But what they mean by that is, I had something in mind. I thought Jesus was going to give me a husband. I thought Jesus was going to make me a success in business. I thought Jesus was going to do this or that, and he didn't. So therefore, I stopped believing. The Bible says Jesus would not commit There's no foundation. That's what that word is talking about. Proverbs 25, 19, confidence in an unfaithful man in time of trouble is like a bad tooth and a foot out of joint. If your foot is out of joint, put weight on it. It will collapse. You try to eat with a broken tooth. You're not going to be, it's not going to work well. And so, This is what Jesus is saying. Need may bring you to Jesus, but that in itself is not enough to keep you over time. The real issue is you cannot have God's best if you won't give him your best. Because what these people are saying is, I'll serve you, I'm not going to give you anything. I want you to keep giving me stuff. And if you will not give God your best, the Bible says God's not going to give you his best. 1 Samuel 2.30, I will honor those who honor me and I will despise those who think lightly of me. There's a made-up story. It's not true. Don't look for it in the Bible. It's not true. Stories told of Jesus He told his disciples, I want you to choose a stone and I want you to carry it for me. But before you choose, I want you to carry that stone all day long. The disciples started thinking about it all day long? If I choose a big one, I mean, I really love Jesus. I get a big, but come on, all day long? And so each of the disciples wound up picking a very small stone. I can handle a little one all day long. And at the end of the day, Jesus said, bring me your stones. And the stones that they gave him, he turned them into beautiful gems. So because they didn't give their best, they robbed themselves. And that is exactly what happens. People who say, I'll serve God as long as you give me what I want, You're robbing yourself. The Bible says Jesus doesn't believe in that kind of faith. Let's talk secondly about being known. The text shows the supernatural knowledge of God. Verse 24, Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men. Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. And I tell you, only God knows the human heart. Jeremiah 17, 10, I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind. 1 Samuel 16, 7, God sees not as man sees. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. In Psalm 139, 1, Lord, you have examined my heart. You know everything about me. Think about the knowledge of God. The knowledge that God has of us is awesome. He knows our words. He knows what you said today. He knows our thoughts. He knows our past. Everything we've ever done. He knows what we are when we're alone and no one is looking. He knows everything And in this text, he knows our motives. Lord, we believe in you, but why? What is it you actually want? 
Why are you doing what you're doing? And is your belief in Jesus based on you? If God gives me my man, if God gives me money, then I'll serve him. Or is it based on Jesus and who he is? 1 Corinthians 3.11, for no other foundation can man lay than Jesus Christ. So in this text, people come, we would call this a successful outreach. They believed on him, but Jesus is not fooled by outward appearances. Not everyone who says hallelujah is spiritual. Do you know that? Not everyone who names the name of Jesus is truly right with God. Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. So God knows everything. You can't fool God. But the point of that knowledge is that the God who knows us, he reveals us to ourselves because it is possible that we don't even know what's really inside. Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? That text says... Our hearts tell lies. And the first person your heart lies to is you. You may try to deceive others. Oh, this is, uh, it wasn't my fault and it was it. But God knows the truth. But you actually lie to yourself, first of all. You can fail to see the truth. So God who knows what is in man God who knows everything, he tries to make sure that we can see the truth ourselves. Jeremiah says the word of God is like a mirror. It's one of the things, some of the things I've said so far, some of you are starting to, you got the Holy Ghost squirm. Because God is revealing, he shows, he says, that's you. That's not for the other guy, that's you. The rich young ruler, he came, Lord, I want to follow you. And Jesus said, let's talk about money. You got a money problem. And he didn't see it. He went away sorrowful. He didn't see what was in him. David, God sent the prophet to say, you are the man. You are guilty. So God knows everything. He exposes, but he exposes in order to cleanse. The context of the story, what happens immediately before the verses that we read, Jesus went to look at the temple. And in the temple, they had people who came, they were from out of town, they were required by law to offer a certain Sacrifice, it was the law of supply and demand. It was kind of like how things got during COVID with toilet paper. <laughs> People, you need a pigeon? <laughs> There's no pigeons to be bought for miles around. I'll sell you a pigeon at radical prices. They're ripping people off in the house of God. And so when Jesus comes in, they're, they're thinking... We are so spiritual, we're, all, we're doing good for the world, and Jesus makes a whip and starts beating people. He starts kicking over their money-making stalls. He cleansed what he saw, because that is the hope that we have. We can't fool God. He will expose what's inside, but when he exposes, he wants to cleanse. This is the hope of the gospel. God knows everything about us, but he doesn't leave us the way we are. John 8, 32, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. 
There was a man named Peter Youngren. He does uh, miracle healing crusades in third world nations. He was preaching in Mombasa, Kenya. There was a man, he was a crazy man who was famous in the area. All the locals in Mombasa, they called him the monkey man because he acted insane. The monkey man, he lived on the streets. He didn't have clothes. His clothes was he would take plastic trash bags from the garbage and he would put those around him as clothes. You can imagine very quickly it would tear. So basically he walked around usually completely naked. The monkey man came to the crusade encountered Jesus Christ, they cast demons out of him. The monkey man got saved and got delivered. They covered him up, brought him on stage, and it was so fascinating what the monkey man said. He looked down at himself. He had been living literally on the garbage dump. And he looked at himself and he said, I am so dirty. He had never noticed this in all of his years of sin. He's looking at himself and he said, I am so dirty. Peter Youngren instructed one of the pastors, take him somewhere where he can bathe. And then he said, I want you to buy him some clothes. The next day they took him to a clothing store that was owned by a Muslim. When the monkey man walked in, the Muslim shopkeeper, he knew who he was and was so shocked at the transformation, he gave him some clothes for free because he could see the transformation. Listen to that. I am so dirty. God, who knows everything, reveals, but when God reveals, it is to cleanse. It is to transform us. Let's look at one final thought. I want to talk about being known and loved some people, when we talk about God's knowledge, my opening illustration, a machine that could read your thoughts, there was somebody like, no, that's not good. Some people feel God's knowledge of them is bad. I've had evangelists tell me that the first night of revival, they gave some words, God's supernatural knowledge, calling people out and specifically telling them what was going on in their life. And they had people in church, instead of the numbers, there were people that stayed away because they thought God's knowledge is scary. God wants to embarrass me. God wants to shame me. God wants to hurt me. The Bible says Jesus knew them. Being known does not have to be bad. As I said, what he wants is to cleanse and transform. But the knowledge of God is actually comforting. It's actually encouraging. Think about two very simple things about God's knowledge of us. Number one, the one who knows us loves us still. Think about that. God knows everything about us, and he is not shocked. He loves us still. He still wants to have relationship with us. Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates it, his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus is at the well in John 4. The woman comes he knows her immoral lifestyle. He knows she's had five husbands. She's shacking up with a, a number six. They're not married. And yet he comes, knowing everything, he comes to offer her living water. Luke twenty two thirty two. 32. I prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. Pastor James Moore, he said he had a friend named Roy. So this story is, is not a made-up story. He was actually there. He said his friend Roy 
their daughter ran away at age 16, living on the streets, became a drug addict, disappeared. They had no idea where she was. Finally, somebody said, someone saw her in Memphis, Tennessee. And so Pastor James Moore drove Roy to Memphis and Roy went to look for his daughter. Said he searched for her all day. He's going into bars and, and places where young people might be. And Pastor Moore said everywhere they went, Roy stuck a picture of this girl's parents with a note that said, Debbie, all is forgiven. We love you. Please come home. Signed, Mom and Dad. Two weeks later, Debbie came home, dirty and hungry. She said, I couldn't believe my eyes. I walked into a bar one night, and I saw my mom and dad's picture. And then I read that note. I ran out of that bar, went to another place, and there was mom and dad's picture. Everywhere I went was my parents' picture and the note forgiving me and saying, come home. For the first time in my life, I realized how much my mom and dad loved me. I've hurt them so many times, broken their hearts so many times, and yet they still came looking for me. They still love me. That is, on a human level, just a small part. Do you know that there is nothing you're going to tell God that is going to shock him? It's not like he thinks... We're like wonderful, and then we're going to say, you know, actually, I got probably like, oh, my God. He knows everything about us and loves us still. Not only that, the second thing is the one who knows us, he sees the potential of our lives. John 1, he brought Simon to Jesus. When Jesus looked at him, he said, you are Simon son of Jodah, you shall be called Cephas, which is translated a stone. Simon, small stone, little pebble. What he's saying is right now you are unstable. That's the mark of your life. You are unstable, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call you, Cephas is Peter, massive rock. I am going to put stability into your life. That is God knowing everything. He wants to cleanse. He loves us still. And he sees potential for us. At the same time, he, he's not fooled. It's not like, I, after you clean yourself up, then I can see potential. He sees it right now. Luke 5, 8 through 10, when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. So also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, they were with him, and Jesus said, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. I'm a sinful man. Jesus knew that before he got in the boat. But he says, But I see what you can become. God can use your life. Pastor John Piper, he wrote down a prayer that he says he prays every day. He says he has a desire for God to work through him for his glory. And so he prays every day, Lord, let me make a difference for you that is utterly disproportionate to who I am because that is God. Don't come to God saying, God, you got to give me and you got to do that. If you don't give me that, then I'm out of here. That will never work. You won't last. God knowing everything, he wants to cleanse and transform. He loves you with all of your problems and he sees potential in your life. Let's bow our heads. all across this place. Thank God. Now, before we do anything else,
I spoke about the God who knows us and loves us still. There are people that are here tonight. God knows that tonight you are living in sin. Some of you, you are far from God. If you'd be honest, if what was in your heart and your life was put on these big screens, that would be shameful, wouldn't it? That would not be good. And yet, as I've told you, God's knowledge does not change his love. While we were yet sinners, that scripture I quoted, Romans 5, 8, Christ died for us. He doesn't wait till we clean up our act, take a self-improvement course. While we were yet sinners, that's when God loves us. And if you're here tonight, if you would be honest about your sin, God could do a miracle inside of you. How many people are here? You say, Pastor Greg, I know I am not right with God. God would not be pleased with the way I'm living. But I want to get right. The God who knows me, I need that cleansing that you just preached about. I need him to change me from the inside out. If you're here and that's you, I want you to do one thing. I want you to lift up your hand so I can see it. Pastor Greg, I need to pray. I want God to forgive me. How many would there be? Hold your hand up so I can see it. I want to get right with God. Thank you. Thank you for that hand. God bless you. How many others? Join this one. I want to get right with God. I need Jesus to cleanse me. I need God to transform me. Others, God's dealing with people. Others, you need to get right. Lift up your hand right now. God loves you. He can do a miracle inside of you. Hold your hand up. Others, you need Jesus right now. Some of you are backslidden. The lie from hell is people who turn away from God, God gives up on them. That is not true. God loves you still. He wants to heal you where you're hurting. How many backsliders lift up your hand? I want to come home. I want to get right with God. Tonight, here's my hand. I need Jesus all across this place. Hold it up. Put it right back down. I want to get right with God. Amen. While our heads are bowed, this lady lifted her hand. Look up at me for a minute. Did you mean that? Yes? Come here. I want to have someone pray with you. Would you come here? She said, someone's going to come with you. God bless you. I appreciate your honesty. Thank God. I want you all to stand up to your feet. I'm going to open the altars. I'm inviting you to come and talk to God. Do business with God. Tell God, God, I want to have the right motives, but help me to be honest with you so that you can transform me. These altars are open. You come and pray. Cast, Cast me not away, away from thy presence, Lord. Take, Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore, Restore unto me. And renew a right spirit. Cast me not away. Cast me not away from thy presence, O Lord. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the, the joy of thy salvation and renew a right spirit within. May let's worship God together right now. Father God, I thank you for your goodness. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God for his goodness. Thank God you rejoice in God's knowledge and love for you and believe God for his goodness in your life. Thank God we're going to be dismissed in prayer. I want to remind you again 
a new Bible study starting on Sunday morning at 9.30 in the adult Bible class, God's Will in My Life. Finding God's Will Personally is uh, what this is about. And so I'm encouraging you to come be a part of that. Let's bow our heads. Kenny Rosa's dismiss in prayer.